Awesome. First of all, an honor, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, there are a lot of people that grow up with hardships and struggles in their life, but the difference is that there was a point in your life where you stopped and you looked and you thought, I can do something with my story. What was that moment in your life where you looked around and went, this is an amazing story and I should do something with this? Well, it was always something that I thought about. Obviously, when you're nine years old and you see a guy kill somebody right in front of you, like I did, just like the movie, you know, like Sonny killed him and I was from me to you. And so it, I wasn't traumatized by it, to be honest with you. People always ask me, you must have been traumatized. You will. I say, no, you know, I, I just thought about it, but I never was traumatized by it. But it always stayed in my mind. And then to make a long story short, I was working, uh, you know, I was an actor, I was in LA, and finally I got fired. I was working the door. And who, who didn't you let in? I read that it was because you didn't let yes, someone in. I didn't let the most famous Asian in the world in, in his own party. <laughs> Why and, didn't you let him in? Well, because he was really nasty to me. He came over, I didn't know who he was at the time, and he grabbed the rope like he was going to go in. And I said, hey, you know, there's certain things you don't do. You don't grab a rope when you're working the door. You don't touch the rope. And I he said, don't you know who I am? I said, yeah, you're the guy who's not getting in tonight. <laughs> and he said, well, you're going to be fired in 15 minutes. I said, yeah, right. And he, the boss came out, and it was Swifty Lazar. And Swifty Lazar was the biggest agent in the world, and uh, I got fired in 15 minutes, just like he said. And I went home, I sat in, uh, I went home and got, got in my uh, beat up car, 1972 Honda Civic, and I uh, drove back to the, my apartment in uh, Hollywood. And I said, what am I gonna do? I said, I got no money, and I ran out of money, and. So I said, well, if they won't give me a great part, I'll write one myself. I said, I'm going to write about my relationship with the wise guy and my father. So I started writing. And I wrote, I would write 10 minutes, perform it for my theater workshop, and then keep five minutes out of that. Then each Monday, I kept writing. I would write during the week, perform it on Monday. And at the end of almost a year, 10 months to a year, I had 90 minutes of this one-man show that was really good and really tight. And I performed it and my life just exploded. Speaking of your life exploding, they instantly wanted to turn it into a movie. At one point, they almost shoved over a million dollars. No, at, at, they, at many points, all they kept doing was offer me. Everybody started out at 250,000, then it went to 500,000, and then it went to one million dollars. But they didn't want me, they wanted just my story just because at that point you weren't as known of an actor i wasn't known at all yeah. to be honest with you uh i mean i did guest star roles on the shows but i wasn't known no you know they wanted to put a star in the role and every star who came to see it wanted to do it mm -hmm. every big director who came to see it wanted to direct it every big producer wanted to produce it so it was crazy all these studio heads and all these people coming to see this person do this but it was such Look, you know, it made me a star, so um, it was pretty, I still do it, in fact. You know, I still do it till this day. Uh, it was one of those things that just, that finally, after they, they I, I refused the million dollars a bunch of times. I and said you, no. And you had, at that point, how much in your bank account? Uh, $200 in the $200 bank. $200 in your bank account, and you turned down uh, a million dollars. $200 in the bank account, yeah, my hand to God. What, what does it feel like to turn down a million dollars? Let me, you know, I, I get asked that question a lot, Jake. That was not the hardest offer. It was the 250 that was the hardest offer. The million wasn't hard anymore because it became numbers then to me. They didn't mean anything. But the 250 came out of nowhere. I was like, what? I, I did the show, you know, to get an agent. You know, I didn't know. And all of a sudden, boom. I saw the reviews and people kept calling and then the studio called and said, look, we'll give you 250,000 for the rights. And I said, what do you mean the rights? I said, I know what you're saying, but I said, but I want to write the screenplay and I want to play Sonny. And they said, no, 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 we can't do that. We want a star and we want an A-plus writer to write it. I said, no, nobody's doing this but me. They said, well, that's not going to happen. It'll never happen. I said, oh, fine. And when I hung up the phone, that was the one I went, what did I just do? <laughs> you know, and then I thought about it and I said, no, no, no. That's, after a couple of days went by, I said, no, I'm playing the role. It'll happen. I know it'll happen. And I just, that was it. So the 250 was the hardest. When they said a million, I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. a million, two million, three million. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen, I said. So at some point, Mr. De Niro mm -hmm. comes along. Then when I turned down, it was like a million something. 
When I turned that down, two weeks later, I get off the stage and stage manager walks over to me and says, Bob De Niro's in your dressing room. He just saw the show. And I walked in there and there was Bob, you know. And I said, hi. And he said, hi. He said, man, it's the greatest one-man show I ever saw. He goes, that's a movie. I said, yeah, I want to make it a movie. And he said, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. He says, I'll play. He goes, you should play Sonny. And you should write it because it's your life. I'll play your father and I'll direct it and we'll go partners. And that's how it happened. I'd imagine at that point in your life, De Niro was someone that you're a fan of. But at that point, oh, he yeah. needs to become your colleague. He needs to become your yeah. equal. How do you make someone who you're a fan of someone that you need to be on equal playing fields with? I felt, I felt very equal. You know, I mean, he was a huge star. I didn't feel equal as, him, as a stardom, of course. But I felt very confident in my ability as an actor. You know, I, uh, you know I, I felt very confident as an actor and as a writer that I could do, that I could do this. Mm -hmm. So that was, I always felt that I was like that. I, have, I had parents who constantly told me that I was going to be somebody, that I was great, and that the saddest thing in life is wasted talent. So I, you know, I got into the actor's studio, I, I worked hard, I studied. I felt confident. Watching A Bronx Tale with my dad when I was a kid is one of the first movie memories I really had yeah. growing up. It's a great movie to see with your father. It really is. Yeah. We were just at a great Italian shop named Fontano's in Chicago. Right. Told the guy behind uh, the counter that we were coming to talk to you. Yeah. He had an amazing story about the movie. And, and yeah. it was a Do you find that the movie hits people on a personal level oh, more so than you expected? Or did you expect that reaction? I didn't expect it, Jake. No, I don't. I, I wrote this 30 years ago. This story has been around 30 years. It's a huge hit in Japan. It's a huge hit in Europe. So you don't have to be from the Bronx to know it, you know? Like I always say in all my interviews, uh, Alfred Hitchcock used to say, there's only three things you could do to an audience. You can make them laugh, you can make them cry, or you can scare them. And he said, if you do two out of three, you got a hit. But in Bronx Tale, we make you laugh, we make you cry, and we scare you. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you will go see Bronx Tale and you will tear up at the end. I'm telling you this ahead of time. With the music, it has taken the one-man show to the movie and now the musical to even another level. Alan Menken, eight-time Academy Award winner, Glenn Slater, three-time Tony nominee, Robert De Niro, two-time Academy Award, co-directed it with four-time Tony winner, Jerry Zaks. Sergio Trullo, who does the dancing, three-time Tony nominee. I have the best people around me. You know, I wrote the book, and the book deserved people like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you'll see when you see it. You know, it's funny, because I feel like there are stories that work as plays, and there are stories that work as movies, and then there are stories that work as musicals. Very rarely does one work as two, much less three. Why does it, why does it work so well? It's the story. The story. It's the first time I'm going to be in the Guinness Book of Records. It's the first time anyone has ever written and performed in the one-man show, in the movie, and a mu it's the first time it's been done, that it's ever, been done, it's ever gone from a play to a movie to a musical. And one day, you'll be entering view, uh, interviewing you, me here again, because maybe five years from now, it'll be the movie to music. <laughs> Actually, I would kill to see that. I think yes. that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Obviously, a very personal story for you. There are a lot of people from your life represented in this story. Yeah. Who was the person you most wanted to see it from your life, and who was the person you least wanted to see it in your life? Well, my parents, I wanted them to see it because it was their life. Right. And it was, a, it was my love letter to my parents, my father, Lorenzo, and my mother, Rosina. You know, they gave up, my father gave up his talent. You know, my father wanted to play saxophone. He wanted to, he played sax, but he wanted to sing. You know, he wanted to be in show business. But he didn't, you know, he became a bus driver. Mm -hmm. So, um, and my mother, you know, worked hard. And I wanted them to see it, and they did. They never saw the musical. Mm -hmm. They saw the one-man show, and they saw the movie. Mm -hmm. And for 25 years, they saw all my success. But my mom just died before the musical. She was 97, and my father was 90. So, he, but, so they saw all my success. So I'm very happy about that. I'm sure they had to be incredibly proud. I was wondering if we could talk about your father for a second. Yeah. I imagine the ultimate honor for your father being played by, by Robert, Robert De Niro. Niro. When you were able to tell him that that was going to happen, what was that moment like for you? It was, it was kind of surreal to him, but the real thing that made it surreal was Bob said he wanted 
He said, look, I'm flying your father up. I want to hang out with him for a month. That was, Bob says, what? What am I going to tell him? I said, Dad, he wants to study you. And he flew my father up, and De Niro studied, hung out with my father for what, one What month. do you do when you <laughs> hang out with Robert De Niro for a month? What are, what are, what well, are some of the things? De Niro is a, you know, obviously is a brilliant actor, and he's really very attentive to detail, and he asks my father questions all the time. What was it like when you drove the bus? How did you put your hand? And how did you, sh you know, hit the change button? And what did you carry with you? And I mean, I, I even told Bob, I go, Bob, you don't have to do all this. Nobody knows my father. You know, if you're playing Richard Nixon, you have to do certain things. But you're playing somebody who's not famous. But Bob De Niro didn't care. You know, that's him, a attention to detail. And when I see the movie, it's my father. Mm -hmm. You know, the little things that I used to sit, by, sit behind my father when he drove the bus, you know. That's my father, you know, he, little things that he did. You know, that's why he is who he is. It's funny, I was just asked moments ago if I'd ever interviewed you before, and I said, no, I've never had the honor. And then there was a moment where I thought, but I feel like I know you because I grew up with the story. Do you yeah. find that people almost approach you yeah. as if they, and are you okay with that? People feeling oh, like yeah. they know you. You know, people always get caught up and people approaching you. As long as they're nice mm -hmm. and they're respectful, fine. You know, that's your job. Mm -hmm. That's your job, man. You know, I worked for a living at one time. I don't want to do that again. I'm grateful. You got to be grateful in this world. If you're not grateful, you'll always be unhappy. Very true. You know, you'll always be unhappy. You know, there's always going to be somebody with more money than you, better looking than you, better position than you, and there'll be always be people less than you. So, you know, how about just like be happy for what you got, you know? And as we wrap up, I was wondering if you could think back to the young version of you, the kid that is represented in this story, and tell that kid how all of this would turn out. What do you think he would have said? He would have said, well, we said it was going to happen. <laughs> That's what he would say, because I knew it was going to happen. How else could I turn down a million dollars and have $200 in a bank? How else could I do that? It was the confidence and the belief that uh, my parents gave me. I, I devote... I. I I devote, it's because of them is where I am now. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I tell people, teach your kids, give them, don't tear them down. As long as they work hard, you know, tell them they could do anything. Anything's possible. Anything. Just think, right now, if you wrote something, and you would, if I told you, if you wrote something, Jake, that, that Robert De Niro would play your father, and they would do your life on stage as a play, as a movie, as a musical. This is going to be around way after I'm gone. Bronx Tale will always be around. My children will benefit from it, and their children will benefit from it. And um, it's a story for the ages. It really is. Well, I'm glad you gave it to us, sir. Oh, Seriously, thank you. what an honor. Uh, thank you so much for your time.